The Football Show on Off The Ball With Sky Watch Premier League, Women's Super League, EFL, Scottish Premiership and much more Live on Sky Sports I'm prepared to anything I can well, to do play it then. country again Do it then What about your start to the game? I was, it wasn't bad, was it? <laughs> Why should there be an honest answer be a mistake? How can a modern day manager not have a mobile phone? Why should he? <gasps> Now you're welcome along, great to have you on the football show this evening. Joe Malloy here with you and very happy to say Mr Pat Nevin joins us as well. Pat, you're very welcome, good to talk to you. Good to be back and uh, feels like a wee while. Don't know why, did we miss last week? We skipped, Possibly did. We skipped um, Monday, yeah, we skipped Monday. I can't even remember why, FA Cup perhaps? Possibly so, possibly. So many different competitions, that's the problem. Try to get your head around which competitions you're playing in. Um, like, see if you're a Chelsea player just now, is, is it Champions League, is it World Club Trophy, EFL Cup, FA Cup? Um, it's, it's all over. And then, oh, by the way, the Premier League's still going on <laughs> as well. But a lot of teams, you know, Man City and Liverpool, exactly the same. So uh, we don't know where we are half the time, but there's lots of games going on. Yes. And amidst that very healthy schedule, footballer kicking cat is where we're starting, believe it or not, because that is uh, the story. In- many respects. So Kurt Zuma ill during the warm-up and the word is ill in advance of the game with a stomach bug. Now the veracity of that's been uh, questioned. There's wonderings if maybe he was taken aback by the reaction in the stadium again and the stress of the whole thing and so he he called it quits in advance. We don't really know uh, the answer to that. What we do know is this story has really gathered pace over the last week. It has um, and he may well have had a stomach bug but that may well have been brought in by the stress um, because Yes, it's kicking a cat, but the media interest and the opprobrium that's been set down on him is incredible. It is one of the biggest things I've seen for years and years and years. And although there's nothing positive you can say about, and I've watched the video and it's horrible and it's inexcusable and nothing to say about that, but the but only is there are other things that have been done worse that haven't been treated as badly as this for a player. Um, but that's not, no way am I defending him in any way whatsoever for doing that. Um, and it's a it's a weird situation because, you know, could you have seen it coming as bad as this? I know the Brits and the English are a nation of animal lovers and cats in particular <laughs> and dogs. Those are the two. Mm. Um, but could you have seen what has grown out into an incredible thing? You know, you think it might have died away after a day or two. No, it's kept on going, and it's likely to keep on going for some time. And uh, I, I excuse the phrase, but it will dog him for years. Yeah, absolutely, it will stick with him. There's no doubt, and it's it's the weirdest thing. I mean, I, I mean, don't ask me what possesses you a to do that, b to put it online. It's like it's stupid. It's getting a bit evil, but on top of that, it's it's the daftest, most brainless thing you've ever seen in your life. It's unthinkably stupid. Um, and he's going to have to suffer for it for a long time. Who knows why these things register the way they do sometimes. I felt he was in big trouble on the Thursday when I was on just looking at, for instance, talk sport reaction on YouTube. And the next suggested video was the Loose Women program talking about it for 10 minutes. And I thought, oh, this has now crossed the line in a big way. And I didn't feel West Ham realised the significance early enough. And so once David Moyes went on TV and was saying things like, you know, he's one of our better players, so therefore I'm picking him, and it's a separate matter. What's happened here is a separate matter to the on-the-field selection. My job is to pick the best team. Kurt is part of that. I just felt big trouble here. And ironically... West Ham's handling of this situation has uh, funneled more outrage the way of Kurt Zuma. People are angry. Anger subsides. Mm -hmm. Uh, But during that immediate peak anger, if West Ham had been ahead of things and said three, four game ban, four weeks wages, maybe six weeks wages, I think contracts allow you to go up to six in certain instances as opposed to two. 100 hours this year at the local animal shelter. There's probably nowhere for that initial wave of anger to go. Instead, West Ham created a, a debate. The, he's not being punished. Football doesn't take this seriously. And so, you know, condemnation in isolation can only go on for so long. There's only so many ways you can say you're appalled by the video, but 
West Ham, I think, inadvertently created a debate around the handling of this and so by extension a debate around Kurt Zuma. And I mean, I, when Graeme Souness was doing his thing yesterday, that was where I thought, wow, I mean, that's where it had become a touch unpredictable. I, who knows why? I may mean, just assuming he's a bit old school. I thought Graeme Souness might kind of say, this is a touch ado about nothing. But he was quite the opposite, you know, and, and a lot of people really agreed with him. Um, as for the gymnastics, whereby we all uh, behave barbarically towards so many animals and love other animals, that's a whole other show. Exactly. Um, I, I, what you said there, the one word that jumps out is inadvertently. Uh, and that is maybe the, one of the biggest problems in the way they dealt with it. They absolutely didn't see it coming, West Ham, did they? And I know Moisey didn't see it coming. No. They wouldn't have seen that coming at all. But what you tend to do in those situations, because I will then put myself in a position of, OK, I'm an executive at a club, what do I do here? And, that, and these things, you know, they hit you sometimes and you think, well, wait a minute, how bad can it be? Do an eight-step by the player, you know, is the what is the norm? The norm is a two-week sanction of wages is the maximum allowed unless it's uh, gross misconduct. And there's an argument whether that is or isn't. In some people's eyes it would be, but, you know, normally that wouldn't be seen as gross misconduct within your actual job. Um, so if you start going down the legal route, that's where the legal route takes you, yet that's what you do. Um, maybe at an absolute push, at a real push, they might have considered leaving them out for a game. Might have considered that. That's the normal thing before you hit when it goes viral. That's the normal thing. But I think they would have been completely taken aback by it. When Moyes came out and talked about it afterwards, I sat almost behind the sofa thinking, why are you sticking about there to take that? It's got to be behind a club statement. Club, stand in now. You know, all the managers know how to get, you know, what to do in those situations. This is not the first time David Moyes has been stuck in one of these. Remember, there was a the girl reporter that he, he certainly misspoke in that one and apologised for it as well. Um, but football people, A, tend to go back on you, what they know, which is football. But the people at the executive level, they, they need to have the air motor again. But we know they haven't. We know from the Super League, they haven't. They, they don't get the touchstone of what the populace is feeling. And when you actually see that that's happening, you need to be able to do something about it. However, they may look to other parts of society and think, OK, what's the behaviour of other people in the public eye just now? And if you're Boris Johnson, then you can do whatever you're doing just now and just brass neck it out. They must think, well, you know, we'll brass neck this one out for a while. Um, but it's just back to that mad thing of, you know, the British people, understandably, and I'm one of them, you know, we, we don't like the mistreatment of animals in that sort of way. Um, do you remember, I don't know if you remember, I don't know how big a story it made in Ireland. There was a woman who stuck a cat in a bin. Honestly, the most hated woman mm. in the country for a year. Honestly, hated, despised. It was all horrible and much worse, let's be honest. You know, evil's done to women and children and whatever. But no, no, she got it because it was a cat and she was caught on camera. So trying to have gauged before that that she was going to get that or Kirk Zuma was going to get it to this level, I don't think you would have gauged it. I don't think most people would have. But as soon as you see it hitting, you then need to react. They tried to react by the two weeks' wages, um, internal matter. You can't fluff it. It's gone beyond fluffing it now. And uh, I think they wish they'd have probably given them a, a, week, a, a game or two games. More than that, I don't think. Yeah. You know, I think that's what would have probably not necessarily seen it off, but it would have faded quicker. And as you say just now, it's West Ham, it's David Moyes, it's Zuma. And it's, uh, it's kind of, it's got a life of its own. It does. There is... It's got more life than the cat. <laughs> a slim chance that they will meekly now have to hand out a one-game suspension just to quell this. I'm not sure how it goes. And uh, I do suspect that you're right when you talk about the the mentality inside the dressing room now because we saw Mikel Antonio roll down his uh, window as Karen speak journalist and make the... Look, it can be accused of what aboutery, but it's a not unreasonable point that there have been players guilty of outright racism on the pitch who have been promptly forgiven and are back playing football very, very quickly, would you consider racism to be worse than what Zuma did to the cat? And journalist at the window is probably not sure what to say back to that. But, you know, I, I would think within the confines of the dressing room, they're all saying, this is ridiculous. 
Like, uh, take one glance at the world and look how and explain to me how our teammate is hate figure number one, even though they won't condone it either. So, you know, you just wonder if if anyone in there is saying, actually, everyone, hang on, I think we maybe have to put our hands up here and and admit that we didn't handle this very well. Like, I think ultimately the biggest responsibility falls on the executive. They should have taken mm-hmm. David yeah. Moyes out of the situation. They should have taken the decision out of his hands. They should have said to Zuma, this is what's happening. And uh, very quickly, all of this, like I said, it just doesn't blow up into what it's become. So I think they've really failed here. And, and I, I, I guess, you, as you rightly say, sometimes we presume that they are sharper and more in touch with things than they often are. In this case, they just haven't been at all. I mean, they've sat in their hands and said... Uh, Moisey, can you go out there and do the perfect interview and make the perfect decisions and navigate this for us and don't put a word wrong? Thanks very much. Um, and by the way, do you think you could have done it? Uh, <laughs> do well, I think I could have done yeah, it? I mean, I, I'm not I, sure other than saying I'm not playing him next week. Yes. But I didn't play him. I wouldn't put. I don't think there was another way around it there. So in the fact that he played, I'm not sure there's a, a set of words that can get around that. I agree, I yeah. I don't think there's yeah. a politician that can do that. So that's why I said... I was behind the sofa saying, oh, my God, you're not going out there, are you? Because yeah. that's a pack of rules. See, do, do you talk about the racism thing, the, the water buttery, as we call it? We've had, a, we've had water buttery in Scotland for a long time. It's a <laughs> big, big thing that goes on here. Um, and it's, it's the weirdest thing because if I was in the dressing room and one of my teammates had kicked a cat, mm. uh, I'd be annoyed about it, right? Yeah. And another one of my teammates had gone out, got drunk, drove along, and get three times over the limit and could have killed somebody. I know who I'm more ang- angry with. I absolutely know who I'm more angry with. And not to that might not have just killed a cat. He might have actually gone and killed people or children or anyone mm. with driving a car like that. So, you know, that whole what about thing is it's a very, very strange situation. But you have to have your f- finger on the pulse and know what's important uh, socially as well. And, you know, they, they, they absolutely got it wrong. But you're right. Where Where, where are the kind of the correct levels to deal with this because they don't know. Yeah, You don't know when the, th- the big thing's going to kick up online. I mean, I know myself and anyone in the public I know himself, you'll be walking along one day and the next day in the middle of a Twitter storm and you never saw it coming. You absolutely never saw it coming. There's certain things you say, you think, well, I'm going to get battered for that. Mm. And it's, uh, I mean, I always put myself back in a position. My one, my worst one ever was, was at Motherwell and a, a picture was released of Andy Gorham and Andy Gorham had a red flag, a uh, red hand of Ulster behind him, and a UD or UVF sign, right? And uh, I'm, I'm sitting there going, I need to deal with this. And then within a day or two, there was suggestions of he was going to be taken out at the next game by a high-powered rifle, and the next game happened to be about Celtic. Now, mm. seriously, at that point in time, you really need to... A, you, there, there is no win. You understand this? There's no win, right? What you know is you do the best loss you can get in that situation. And also, if possible, do the right thing. Yeah. <laughs> what you think is the right thing. Um, and maybe that's where they fell down. A, they didn't see it. But B, they tried to do what was the, the right thing for themselves, to keep themselves, you know, like I get a player playing yes. and make sure they got the points. And that's what they missed. It. Yeah. They did all the window dressing, but when it came to the painful punishment they uh, squelched on that one uh, just a, a point on Zuma himself uh, like we, we, we're going to be open to accusations here of, well why are we concerned about Kurt Zuma fair enough I mean we can get into funny territory with all this stuff I mean there was Graeme Sunis yesterday saying as far as he could see the cat had done nothing wrong which made the incident worse but then uh, I did see people on Twitter suggesting there was an element of victim blaming here because is Graeme Sunis suggesting if the cat had done something wrong then this kind of punishment would be warranted so look we can go uh, several layers deep here but I thought what was uh, very apparent in Jamie Carragher's point of view yesterday and nobody's condoning what happened uh, but Carragher, without ever mentioning it, was speaking as somebody who had been videoed spitting at a 12-year-old girl and who had genuinely, I think, uh, gone through a kind of torment and hell himself. And he talked to Gary Neville recently about going to see Steve Peters in the aftermath. And he understood what the initial public shaming does and the horror of that, and then just always being the guy associated with that act. What's that like? And so, I mean, I think that was that was what was coming through him yesterday. And... I, I, Let's say Zuma ate the wrong food and and it's a legitimate stomachache, but it's not beyond the bounds, as you said, that the stress has brought all this on. He uh, he may want out of England very quickly here because 
uh, the, the charge he now pays in the internet age is he is the guy who kicked the cat and that, that is all he's going to be in the eyes of a huge percentage of people and you know the, it's rotten like we're, we're too flawed as human beings to have this technology to capture our every uh, mess up but he's in that position now and this is not an easy road back for him I think now it isn't because your view of self has changed because everyone else's view of you has changed and you have to find a way around that and dealing with it Carragher's was, was a long time actually Quite a long time, and you know, it's an, and lots of people might have forgotten about it, but you know, in your mind, you've still kind of got it there. It's not only who he is, but it's still a wee part of who he stroke is, stroke was. Um, and Kurt's going to have to deal with that, and it's your capabilities of dealing with that. Now, it just so happens that quite recently I've had to uh, deal with a friend who, um, you know, it, it, it took the ultimate decision and, and he's no longer with us. And that's always slightly in the back of my mind. You don't know what stress you're putting on people. You, do, you don't know the push. And my, that's why I might sound a little bit softer sometimes. Because I have to say to people, look, life should go on. You can learn from it. You can do positive things from it. Um, and the, the jargon about which starts saying you either you own it. you know, So mm. you say, OK, I did that. Mm. And I will not hide from it. And I won't duck it. And I will stand up and say it and continue to say sorry for it. Um, and that's the only way to do it. The idea of ducking out of the way and being quiet for a while, it, it's, it's, not going to, it's not going to work. It's not going to go for it because you need to actually face it within yourself as well. So Kurt has to do that. But we don't know how good he is at coping with that. We don't know how good he is. He might be sitting in his house every single night, absolutely distraught at the edge, you know, and we don't know that. Um, so that's why I always try to give something to get out for people and say, you know, in situations like that, whatever you've done, you know, is, you, you have to learn, A, to live with, but learn to accept the mistake you made and continually just stand up to it and own up to it and, and don't slink away from it. Just mm. Don't slink away from it. Just be there for it and take it. And I think when people see that, what they then see is the understanding that you accept it and you are sorry for what you've done and A, you won't, a sorry for it, B, you won't do it again. And not, and this is the absolutely important important thing. See if people think you're just sorry that you get caught. Yeah. They're not, they're not, they're not forgiving you, and neither should they. Mm. And that's where he has to kind of slightly stand up and own it. He will have to come on TV one day or radio one day and do a big interview yeah. and talk about it. I, I, I think that's a good idea. I agree. And, uh, and then I think people would be quite quick, quick to forgive if they saw the genuine contrition because, hey, look... If, if if we ever want you know all of us step forward and list out our top five mistakes in life, I'd be curious to hear everyone's uh, revelations. You know, there is that kind of aspect of human behaviour. It, it, it goes away. I mean, nobody knows about me missing a penalty against Man City, do they? Did you? Oh, I forgot. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was. I reminded of that again the other day. That's anyone who doesn't know, which I try to tell everyone, like the like, worst penalty ever. It rolls it to the keeper and he just st- leans down and picks it up. But at least that was on target. Did you see Zaha's the other day? <laughs> you know, Zaha. Jeez, no, there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's, there's a real sense all the same as Zaha of one of the great talents that got away. That could have been something a bit more special, I think, that career. Um, yeah. Um, and you have to be in the right places at the right times and take the chances. And he did. You know, he was at a massive club. And he had to be in the right place at the right time. But also you had to have the right style with with him and the management and the coaching had the right style and he his head had to be in the right place at the right time. Mm. And the very, very best of his career, ability wise, you would put him in a Chelsea team or a Man City team or a Man United team or whatever. He would be good enough for those squads for pure ability. But it takes more than ability. Yeah. It takes everything. It takes the whole thing. And take nothing away from it. To become a top class professional footballer and be as talented as him and have a very good career takes a lot. But you're right. It's, it's less than it could have been and it's less than it should have been because you look at the talent that he's got and there's, there's others around as well. I mean, I, I look at Palace just now and I watch him and the boy Eze and Elise and you think any one of them with, with the right trajectory could just about do anything in the game mm. and well above the level of Crystal Palace. Uh, speaking of uh, less than what they could be, so Manchester United are in free fall is what's happening here, surely. Uh, Middlesbrough... Burnley, Southampton. This is a very charitable fixture list and it's been so average. Uh, I'd be wrong to say either of us are shocked that the interim manager isn't quite working out. 
Not really, no. Um, I, d I don't know the guy. So, but to go into a dressing room with the possibility of short termism, you might get some with you, but you don't get everyone with you. And the moment that you're some of the players, and I don't know which ones it would be, would be out of the team. They'll be going, well, he doesn't know what he's doing, and he'll be gone soon anyway. It'll be somebody else picking it, so, you know, shrug your shoulders. Um, I don't actually think I've seen a lack of too much effort. I think there's been a wee bit increase in effort for them, um, but it's just not looked anywhere near the lift that they expected or wanted from them. Um, they need to get that sorted out by the end of the season. Everybody knows that. Um, but are they dreadful at the moment? I don't think they're dreadful. I think there's, they're just kind of sort of the same-ish, maybe a tiny bit better than social. I don't know if the percentage of, of games won tells you that, but there's been quite a few games where they've been the better team and they've had chances. And in a normal time, you'd say that they probably should have won that game and they haven't. That's the difference between good, really good teams and quite good teams. They know how to do that and they've got that extra bit about them. Um, but looking at them, it's it's not quite the side, you know, but I think the right manager in there still makes them a very, a very, very decent side, t certainly top four. Well, it should. I mean, they've spent a billion quid. You know, this is the thing. Exactly. You know, what standards are we <laughs> judging them by? Because <laughs> Ralph Hassan Huddle, on your point about a lack of effort, he said it's not a big secret that when they lose the ball, their reverse gear is not always the best. And uh, I would say on the effort point, I, I, I humbly disagree with you. I would say one of the defining sights this season is of team playing Manchester United, dangerous situation building, and genuinely, insert your name here, it could be Rashford, it could be Lingard, it could be anyone else who's out wide across the season, just trotting back and watching the situation blossom as opposition score a goal. And I, I, that's exactly, I mean, Hassan Hull felt bold enough to even say that. Well, I, you, you could add Bruno Fernandes on it. Fantastic player. So many of them, yeah. Yeah, you definitely could ask, add Pogba into it almost every time. You could, so it's a cultural thing that actually needs to change. Um, but effort in comparison to before, I think there's been an increase for some of them. Okay. Um, but I'm just thinking very recently. But does that make them a team that puts the levels of intensity in as most of the other teams in the Premier League? No, I don't think it does. I still think there's a, there's a wee bit too much of a, right, well, we're this good and it should happen for us. And of course, in the Premier League, it doesn't now. There's too many good sides, too many well-organised sides, too many unbelievably hard-working sides that won't let that happen. It can be Burnley. It can be a team in the bottom of the league. If you don't do it the right way, they will chase and they will harass, harass and hassle you. Um, and that's, I can go back to, I was always kind of questioning whether you bring Ronaldo in as a main man or, you know, someone who can come on and have an effect. I still think he's better as, and I've said this earlier on, I did get a bit of stick for it. I'm thinking, this doesn't look the right one for me, you know, yeah. when you need a team that needs lifted with, with pure effort from the front. And, you know, it's, I think it, it's borne out. And I remember thinking that, thinking, he could end up top goal scorer and it still wouldn't change my mind. Because it's about the entirety of what you give to the team. Um, so I, there's a lots of things wrong there. And the weird thing is we're still talking about who you would bring in and whether that will be good enough and whether he then says, well, you've only spent a billion on it, let's spend some more. Yeah. And you think he's got it. He's going to have to do something. But there's some players in him. I still think McTominay work rate's phenomenal. You know, And if he just got others working at that level. But there are other things. All the retail, every time you look at a position, you think... Hmm, not sure about the yeah. Baran. Yeah. Not as good as he was before. Miles away from it. Maguire, so up and down, it's frightening. Yeah. You know, look at how many goals. The, 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 the most goals created in this season, you look at um, Liverpool and it's Alexander Arnold, right, right back, and Rhys James for Chelsea and all the rest of it. And all the, what are they getting from Wade? You know, no, you know nothing. nothing. Shaw's, nothing. Shaw's stopped overlapping. The right back situation, they need to get someone. Uh, Sancho, I guess, is the one. Right, but I, I don't know. I think there's something rotten in there at this stage, and uh, I don't know what they're going to do. And then, as for the mess above them, I, it's it must be one of the worst run clubs in the elite of world football at the minute. So, you know, we had a journalist on last week who covers Manchester United, and they still have a, a half a million a week contract under Paul Pogba's nose. They have absolutely no idea if the next manager wants Paul Pogba, and Paul Pogba is one of those players that another manager may very well not want. He's that style of player. Where is the thinking there? Where is the, the joined up 
smarts. Are we, are we going to hand over, uh, create a massive Paul Pogba problem for the next manager, potentially? Do we know who the next manager is? Are we asking him on the side, does, would he want Paul Pogba? Because, you know, half a million a week, probably get another player for that, I think, maybe even two. So <laughs> all of this stuff is just... Cont- contracts, awful. though, contracts, though, aren't always offered for the, all the same reasons. They may want to sell Sometimes. them, yeah. Yeah, because some contracts are you need to get them or you're going to lose them for <laughs> free. Yeah. You know? So you, some of those contracts have got that sort of you know fear in them, and you you understand why that has to happen. So mm. you, you know, Pogba's been there a while, and his his return's been really poor this season. I know there's been injuries, but his return's been limited. But you know, and we all know the capabilities of the player. But you're right. But I still think if you can get the best out of Rashford, you've got a right good player. If you can get the best out of Bruno Fernandes, we know you've got a fantastic player. You, and it's all these ifs. Yeah. And it's whether you can get one single guy who can bring in and do that. And, you know, there's, there's, there's very few of them around. I mean, again, like, you, the situation with um, Lukaku and Tuchel, that's, that's an interesting one, isn't it? Because it's the same thing, isn't it? Somebody who's not working to the, the way the rest he needs it works, working. But Tuchel's able to do that. It's taken him a wee while, but it looks as if that's Sad, it's begun to work just the other day he played really well and his energy levels were fantastic and I've not seen that from from him but you've got to get somebody to come in Man United does that we have about half a dozen <laughs> and, get the best. and it's not easy uh, Take your pick from the next couple of topics because there are a few talking points we won't have time to get to them all uh, the Everton performance under Lampard had jotted down uh, a word on City and Sterling who's caught fire. Jurgen Klopp was saying this is his strongest squad ever. He had Gomez, Curtis Jones, Minamino, Origi all unable to make the bench at the weekend. Luis Diaz made his debut obviously and was I think quite impressive. Newcastle, signs of real life there. Spurs have lost three in the bounce and I was going to ask you if someone's going to swoop in and offer Postacoglu a Premier League job. So take your pick. Whatever you've seen, you can you can lead the way here. Uh, to be honest, I'm... Uh... I've seen Liverpool a few times recently and right. uh, I'm loving them. I'm loving what they're doing just now. You know, without uh, Mane and without Salah and suddenly all the problems and worries and complaints in the past about them being able to try and stay with uh, Manchester City over the, the next period, it was always the same argument. It's not a deep enough squad. You're doing amazing to keep this close. And then you look what they've done recently and Jota's been an amazing signing. Um, and even, you know, look, Simicast at fullback. I mean, what a great signing. I mean, the, the Liverpool fans love that guy. He ain't going to get a game. Right? Yeah. But you need that backup. And you start looking around it now and you think, yeah, that's, they're now getting to where they probably should have been with depth beforehand. But Klopp also said an interesting thing that they are not Manchester City, they are not Chelsea, they are not Manchester United. They don't work in those sort of ways without that sort of money they buy what they can afford. He's very, very clear about it. And I love the way he said it. And he, you just like him even more when he says things like that. It's, it's almost a, we're going to live within our means. They're quite wealthy means, but they're not as wealthy as others. Mm. And now that he's had the opportunity to bring these ones in and made these decisions, pushed a wee bit with the DS one because of others were sniffing around. But it looks fantastic. I was there at the game when the, uh, against Cardiff. And uh, they, they brought him on near the end. And the, the reception he got was fantastic. And I just thought, actually, if you've got that creativity and Jota, and, and you just think, yeah, you've, you've got it all. The, the question is just one wee question about Liverpool. I'm not sure. I'm not sure Van Dijk's quite back to what he was. No, he's definitely not. Still, you know, and I watched him and I'm thinking, that effortless chasing back where you know he's going to catch and he's going to get people... It's quite often now that they're getting behind them. And you have to just go up, your hands up about it. And I don't think it's a real Ferdinand situation. I remember watching Real. It was a game down at Swansea many years ago for Man United. And then just watching it was the start of the season. And I watched somebody run away from him and thought, ah, oh, it's gone. Hmm. And But he was a good bit older than Van Dijk is now. And I don't think it's gone with him. But you wonder, I'd, I'd be interested to see how Van Dijk starts next season. That would be very, very intriguing. Get him back, and then you're okay. they're okay, and they'll be back up chasing Manchester City again. But no, they're they're brilliant to watch, and uh, that kind of it didn't hurt. But you know, I'd rather have talked about Everton first. <laughs> well, just uh, w- w- I would come to Everton because that was a genuinely exciting performance from their point of view. Michael Edwards leaving Liverpool 
So I, it, it, it's difficult because on the outside, he's called the transfer guru and gets a lot of credit. But inside, who knows, you know, how much influence he's having. I suspect considerable. But they, they have been almost immaculate in the, in the transfer window. And you mentioned Diogo Jada. Uh, I, I don't know if, if any of us anticipated just how well he would do. How close is he to putting genuine pressure now on that front three to say one of you has to come out, do you think, for their big Champions League games, for their biggest games? Um, well, it is only one that's going to come out because uh, Mane's not coming out and Salah's not coming out. It's, so it's only one other. And so it might be Firmino, it, it might be him. Um, and just watching the way he played, the fact that he's, he's not the tallest, but he's brilliant in the air. He's such a sniffer of goals. He's an intelligent player. There's a, there's a very good argument that I'm not sure if he is first choice yet, but I think it's a toss yet coin. Mm. You know that he is actually one of the front three now. He has been that superb this season. Um, I'm not just saying this, by the way. As I'm talking to you, I don't know if you noticed. I had a wee flick down at the bottom of my screen there, right? Go on. And what's, what's come through at the bottom of my screen? I had a PCR test earlier on today. <laughs> oh, Pat! Don't reveal live on air. No, no, no. It's just because I'm going to Milan tomorrow for the Inter Milan Juventus. Okay, okay, <laughs> good. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. And you're still going? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, it's up to you. If you want to open your PCR test live on the internet, I mean... It's a... I suspect not. I had COVID uh, six weeks ago and I've, I'm triple jabbed. I'm, I'm the whole way, so okay. I uh, I am I have a suspicion that I'm actually OK. Um, I can't even know. I can't even tell you how to open it. So everyone's waiting for it. Can we wait? Page not found. I'm going to have to find a way again. Yeah, I think, I think let's, be, let, let's not do that to you just in case. Um, <laughs> let's move to... Everything that yep, should be, you know, fun in Milan. So, uh, th- th- I mean, geez, it was lively. It was kind of that quintessential Goodison atmosphere that you want. A uh, twenty-year-old Anthony Gordon embodies a lot of that energy. I give him the benefit of the doubt here. This is just youth, and it's all meant in a very um, nice way, I'm sure. So Lampard was saying this guy can go a long way in the game, and they asked Gordon about Lampard, and again, he doesn't mean this in a bad way. He's young and doing interviews and everything. He surprised me really with how good he is tactically. <laughs> <laughs> is what he said of Frank Lampard and then he said it, and then he went on to say he's a tactical genius and I'm thriving off that I'm learning from him every day stuff I hadn't heard before so um, I'm sure some, I'm sure even Lampard with a wry smile uh, saw that quote he's, he surprised me uh, tactically uh, says 20 year old Anthony Gordon so um, what's what's Lampard doing here with Everton or trying to do do you think um, I was surprised Gordon because he's just became even more integral I think he's probably said to Gordon, do do your thing, just get on the ball. I mean, his vision was a little reverse pass that eventually ended up in Seamus's goal. Um, it, that was world class. It was just phenomenal that he's seen it, you know, the timing of the pass. It's a pass that most people wouldn't see. Um, and it, he almost would kind of gloss over it because you're, you, and then on the top of that, the amount of players that were flying into that box as well, Coleman being the most obvious one, but that tempo that he's increased for them, that willingness to say to him, no, attack people, attack everyone, don't be negative, don't be, you know, play the percentages. And it, let's be fair, it looked as if they were doing that under uh, Rafa. But with Frank, no, they're not having that at all. They're, they're going a different route. Um, and it's, again, it's an old one. People want very, very complicated things. And that's one or two tweaks that you can see. But one of the biggest tweaks you can see is if you can tell players, by the way, you're really good and they start believing you, it's an amazing difference it can make. It also helps. That crowd at Goodison are phenomenal. They're absolutely phenomenal when they're behind you. And when they're gone in the back of the team, you can feel it. And they've got a kind of, it's hard to explain, but because it's happened quite often at Everton, when there's a negative time, it's not booing right away. It's, just, it's like you're in a bar and someone's talking about you behind you. You know, you just get your get back, <laughs> the in your back of your neck, stand up. Goodison's a bit like that. Oh, God, are they like this again? Mm. Kind of thing. Oh, we can see what's going on here. And it's a kind of low, not even a rumble, it's just kind of this weird kind of sound or silence that you get. However, if you give them the good stuff, it's, it's Goodison as we know it. It's, it's fantastic. It's, it's a great lift that Frank's got. Um, the tactical stuff has been fine. It's helped that he's got Richarlison up there alongside calvert Lewin, and that's developing space for the others to come behind. He tried three at the back against uh, Newcastle, and well, even though they had the vast majority, uh, majority of the possession, it, I don't know if it suited them that well. 
going back to this more old old school way it seems to suit the players and uh, it, I think that's well done Frank you've tried something didn't really work even though in the face of it it was good for possession but it didn't work whereas this way you're just letting people go and it's you know watching Gordon watching Coleman flying into the box I mean that was Seamus of old wasn't it yeah it's great you know, it, was just, it was fantastic to see him doing that and he's just he's given everyone a in the simplest terms, an incredible lift. I've had a good look at the fixtures coming up. It's not going to be easy to carry on. <laughs> and some fixtures are a bit easier than others. So he's got some... You know, had they beaten Newcastle, they'd have had a massive gap between themselves and Newcastle, but they lost to Newcastle. So it's a lift, but they're still they're still in it. They're still fine. Listen, great chat. Thanks, Mel. Pat Nevin. Absolute pleasure.